Roller coaster rides can be modeled using a series of polynomial functions of degree three and four and combined in such a way to create a curve that traces the track of the ride. Engineers can then use that model to simulate various rides that a person could have without actually having the person ride the roller coaster. Hi, my name is Tom Atwater, and in today's lesson we will be exploring polynomial functions of degrees 3 and 4. Now a polynomial function of degree 3 is called a cubic function, and a polynomial of degree 4 is called a quartic function. Recall that a polynomial of degree n can be written as follows. You can have f of x is equal to a sub n times x to the n plus a sub n minus 1 times x to the n minus 1, and it works itself all the way down until we end up with the last few terms as a, a sub 2 times x squared plus a sub 1 times x, and then we end with the constant term a sub 0. And remember that a sub n, which is the leading coefficient, the coefficient in front of x to the n, cannot equal 0. Let's examine some important definitions associated with polynomial functions and this particular equation. We have the vocabulary of polynomials. Each monomial in the previous sum, and those were a sub n times x to the n, and then a sub n minus 1 times x to the n minus 1, and all of them down to a sub 0, is a term of the polynomial. So each one of those is a term. A polynomial function written in this way with terms in descending degree is written in standard form. The constants a sub n, a sub n minus 1, all the way down to a sub 0 are the coefficients of the polynomial. And the term a sub n times x to the n is the leading term and a sub 0 is the constant term. OK, well, in our first example, we use the fact that the constant term a sub 0 of a polynomial p is both the initial value of the function, in other words, it's p of 0, and it's also the y-intercept of the graph. And it can provide a quick and easy check for transformations of graphs. So let's take a look. Describe how to transform the graph of an appropriate monomial function f of x is equal to a sub n times x to the n into the graph of the given function. Sketch the transformed graph by hand and support your answer with a grapher. Compute the location of the y-intercept as a check on the transformed graph. So the examples we're going to work with are part A, that g of x is equal to 4 times the quantity x plus 1 cubed. The second graph we're going to work with will be that for h of x is equal to negative, and then the quantity x minus 2 raised to the fourth power plus 5. So let's take a look at part A. Part A, you can actually obtain the graph for g of x by taking the graph f of x equals 4x squared, or sorry, 4x cubed, and shift it one unit to the left. And that would then give us the transformed graph. So let's take a look at that graph itself, and we have it here. So we took x cubed, f of x equals x cubed, and the first thing was to multiply it by 4, which then stretched it in the vertical direction, and then we had the 4 x plus 1 cubed, and so we shifted it, as you can see, to the left one unit. Now, we were supposed to check the 
initial value, that is the y-intercept, in this case, g of x is equal to 4 times x plus 1 cubed, so we want g of 0. If we plug 0, and this is our g function now, we plug 0 in for x. 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 cubed is 1 times 4, so g of 0 is 4. And in fact, that checks out. So, what we're going to do next then is look at part B. And part B, we have the graph here. And in this case, what we do is we could obtain the new graph by shifting the graph of f of x equals negative x to the fourth. So let's write this down. What we have is f of x is negative x to the fourth. And so we can write out the shifts that occur to give us h of x. And h of x is negative. And now we've shifted it to the right 2. So that becomes x minus 2 to the fourth power. But we've also gone up 5, so we have to put a plus 5 after that initial term. So to check for the y-intercept, to make sure that we've got a transformed graph in the correct position, we actually find h of 0. Now h of 0 means sticking in 0 for x. 0 minus 2 is negative 2. Raise that to the fourth power, and it gives us 16. But that's negative 16 because of the negative in front of the parentheses. Plus 5, and that, of course, gives us negative 11. And if we check, it looks as though it's going through negative 11 as our y-intercept. So it looks like we've got the correct transformation. All right, next we will examine typical graphs of a cubic function. So let's take a look. All right, I want you to notice the difference. Here we have a positive leading coefficient, and on this one we have a negative leading coefficient. And let's look at the differences here. If we were to draw an x-axis in such a way that it intersects the graph as many times as possible, for instance, here's my x-axis, that would intersect at most three times. And that represents the x-intercepts, of which in this case there would be three of them. Also notice that there is at most one local high point and one local low point. And these represent the local extrema, of which there are at most two, this one and this one. And with the difference is now when we look at a negative leading coefficient, the same things that I just described to you apply. That is, we would have at most three intercepts, at most two local extrema. But the difference is, well, if we look at this graph, as x goes towards positive infinity, the value of the function, the y value, is going off to positive infinity. As x goes to negative infinity, so does y go off to negative infinity. And how is that different than when we have a negative leading coefficient? It's different because it's the exact opposite. As x goes to positive infinity, y goes to negative infinity. And as x goes to negative infinity, y goes to positive infinity. Well, the next thing we should examine would be graphs of quartic functions. So let's take a look at these. In the first case, we have a positive leading coefficient. And in the second case, we have a negative. And the difference, again, is in the case of a fourth degree, you know, x to the fourth, what you'll notice is that if it's a positive leading coefficient, then both of the end behaviors are that they go off to positive infinity. For the negative, you'll notice both end behaviors go off to negative infinity. Well, let's say I were to draw the x-axis in such a way that it intersects the graph in as many times as possible. You'll see, for instance, there, that it's four times. And those, again, represent 
the four x-intercepts. Be the same thing even if the leading coefficient were negative. Well, what about the local extrema? In this case, you would have at most three local extrema, and that's true with the negative leading coefficient as well. Now, what this does is it leads us into the following theorem, and that is local extrema and zeros of a polynomial function. So let me read this. A polynomial function of degree n has at most n minus 1 local extrema and at most n zeros. Now, before we look at an example of that theorem, I want to look at the n behavior of the graphs of polynomial functions. So here we have, for any polynomial function f of x, and then the polynomial, the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x and the limit as x goes to negative infinity of f of x are determined by the degree n of the polynomial and its leading coefficient. So let's take a look at examples of these graphs. Here we have a cubic equation and or a cubic function, I should say. And what we're saying is, with a cubic function, which means that the value of, if I had a, I'm sorry, that's a sub n times x to the n, what we're saying is if n is odd, and this is true, this, is a, this happens to be a cubic, but it will be true for any of the odd values for n, You'll see that the limit as x goes to infinity is infinity, and the limit as x goes to negative infinity is negative infinity. And that's for a positive leading coefficient and an odd degree of the function. All right, well, let's take a look at another graph. And in this case, when the leading coefficient is negative, you'll see that it's just the opposite. That is that the limit goes to negative infinity as x goes to positive infinity, and the limit goes to infinity as x goes to negative infinity. All right. Well, what about when we have a quartic? In this case, we have a positive leading coefficient, and this is a quartic, but it's going to apply to whenever n is even. So even if n were a 6 or, or 8, the Leading coefficient is positive. In this case, both of the n behaviors are that they go to positive infinity. Well, I'm sure you can imagine what will happen is if we have a negative leading coefficient and we have, again, an even number but a negative leading coefficient, then in that case, both n behaviors are that they go off towards negative infinity. All right, I think the best way to see this is to do an example. So let's take a look at graphing a polynomial in a window showing its extrema and zeros as well as its end behavior. Describe the end behavior using limits. And the problem we have is f of x is equal to x cubed plus 2x squared minus 11x minus 12. And we want to graph that. So we would plug it into the grapher, exactly the way it's written here, and it would give us this graph. So let's look at the graph and look at the intercepts as well as what's happening with respect to the end behavior. We can specifically see that we have an intercept at 3. That is an x-intercept at 3. We have one at negative 1, and we have one at negative Four. Now, in terms of the local extrema, the maximum number we should get, since this is a cubic equation, would in fact be 2. And we can see that we have local extrema at those two points, which is exactly what we would expect to find. What about the end behavior? Well, we can see that it's going off to infinity on the right-hand end. And the way we would write that is the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x is equal to infinity. 
What about the other end behavior, this side? We can see that it's going off to negative infinity. So we would write that as the limit as x goes to negative infinity of f of x is equal to negative infinity. And that's, of course, what we would expect since this would be, this is a cubic function with a positive leading coefficient. Now recall that real number zeros of a function, f, is equivalent to finding the x-intercept. In other words, we have the graph y equals f of x, and the solutions to the equation f of x equals 0 are those intercepts of the graph. In fact, let's do a problem in which we solve it by factoring. So we have find the zeros of f of x equals x cubed minus x squared minus 6x. So to solve this problem, we factor the right-hand side. So this would be equal to x, because there's a common factor of x in each term, times x squared minus x minus 6. And then we can factor that quadratic. This would be x minus 3 times x plus 2. And remember that when you find the zeros, you're finding when f of x is equal to 0. What that means now is each one of these terms could possibly be 0. And if x were 0, the whole thing would be 0. So we can come up with x equal to 0. And in this case, if x is equal to 3, this would be 3 minus 3, which is 0. And that would give us 0. And in this case, x equals negative 2. So the three zeros are 0, 3, and negative 2. And remember, those would also be then the x-intercepts. All right, now let's take a look at when a factor is repeated. For example, here's a function, f of x plus 1 squared times the quantity x minus 2 cubed. And in each case, for instance, this would give us zeros of x equals negative 1. Well, look what happens. Here's the intercept. Actually, let me do that in red. Here's the intercept x equals negative 1. And what I want you to notice is that the graph doesn't actually cross that. What it does is it comes up and just touches the x-axis at x equals negative 1. And then it bounces right back down. Well, what you'll notice is we get x equals minus 1, but we would get it twice in a sense because this really is x plus 1 times x plus 1. And that's what we call a repeated 0. In this particular case, it's repeated an even number of times. And what that means always is when it's an even number, the graph is just going to touch the axis and then bounce back in the same direction from which it came. Well, what about this response over here? We know that we're going to get x equals 2, but this time it's repeated three times. And that makes a big difference, because look what happens. Here's our intercept of 2. And you'll notice that this time the graph does cross the x-axis. And in fact, the reason for that is that this is an odd number. And that's true. Anytime you have a repeated factor with an odd number, it'll cross the x-axis. It'll cross through that x-intercept. Mathematicians have a name for this. In this case, x plus 1, when it's squared, we say that the x-intercept of negative 1 has a multiplicity of 2. And the answer, or the x-intercept x equals 2, has a multiplicity of 3. In fact, let's take a look at the theorem for multiplicity. Multiplicity of a 0 of a polynomial function. If f is a polynomial function, and the quantity x minus c raised to the m, 
is a factor of f, but the quantity x minus c raised to the m plus 1 is not, then c is a 0 of multiplicity m of the function f. Let's look at the theorem for odd and even multiplicities because it follows right up from this. Zeros of even and odd multiplicity. If a polynomial function f has a real 0, c, of odd multiplicity, then the graph of f crosses the x-axis at c comma 0. And the value of f changes sign at x equals c. Well, what about when the multiplicity is even? Let's take a look at that. If a polynomial function f has a real 0 c of even multiplicity, then the graph f does not cross the x-axis at c comma 0, and the value of f does not change sign at x is equal to c. Let's work an example where we can see this in reality. State the degree and list the zeros of the function f of x is equal to x plus 2 quantity cubed times x minus 1 squared. Well, if we look at this, we know that this gives us an intercept of x equals negative 2. This gives us an x-intercept equal to 1. All right, but now we want to state the degree of this, and notice that this is x cubed, that would be x squared, so the degree is equal to 5. So the degree is 5, and we have our x-intercepts of negative 2 and positive 1. Well, let's take a look at the same function, and let's take a look at the graph of it, because we're going to sketch the graph of f. We know that, remember, I already said x was equal to negative 2, but that has a multiplicity of 3. Remember what that means is that it will cross the axis. This intercept, x equals 1, has a multiplicity of 2 which means it's not going to cross, but it's just going to touch the axis. So let's take a look at the actual graph now. We have the graph drawn right here. We can see clearly that it's crossing the x-axis at x equals negative 2, which was the cubed part, and that it's just touching at x is equal to 1, which was the squared part part of it. All right, so that was great. Well, and now it's time for you to try a problem. State the degree, the zeros, their multiplicity, and whether the graph crosses the x-axis of the function f of x is equal to x times the quantity x minus 3 squared. Then sketch the graph of f. Pause the video to work on this problem, and when you are finished, restart the video to check your solution. Welcome back. Let's find out how you did on this. So, we have the function f of x equals x times x minus 3 quantity squared. Well, in this case, you should have found that x was equal to 0, and that it had a multiplicity of 1, because it's an understood exponent of 1. Here we have x is equal to 3 as the 0, and that's going to have a multiplicity of 2. Now, what does that mean in terms of what we're looking at here? Well, we have our graph. And remember that that's our 3, and that that was a squared term. It was x minus 3 quantity squared. It had multiplicity 2. And remember, an even multiplicity means that it just touches and goes back in the same direction, which when I say that, what it means is it doesn't change sign. What about this, x equals 0? Well, that had a multiplicity of 1, and therefore it crosses the axis, which means it does actually go from either negative to positive, 
which is the case here, or it could be that it goes from positive to negative, which would then be another type of an example. We are going to finish today's lesson with the intermediate value theorem, which explains that a sign change implies that there's a zero, a real zero of the function. So let's take a look at that. The intermediate value theorem. If A and B are real numbers with A less than B, and if F, a function F, is continuous on the interval from A to B, then F takes on every value between F of A and F of B. In other words, if Y sub 0 is between F of A and F of B, then Y sub 0 will be equal to F of C for some number C that's in the closed interval A, B, comma, B. In particular, if F of A and F of B have opposite signs, i.e. one is negative and the other is positive, then F of C will equal 0 for some number C in that closed interval A, comma, B. Well, of course, as with lots of theorems, the be oftentimes the best way to get an understanding of them is to look at the graph. So let's look at a graph of the intermediate value theorem. What we have, then, is two x values of A and B. We have their corresponding function values, the y value, right here. That's f of A. Here, we have the corresponding y value to B. In other words, we have f of B. We can see that the graph, and I'm just going to highlight it in blue, is continuous on that interval. In other words, there's no discontinuity there. We're going to point out that we have this value C. And if we look at f of C, we will notice that in particular, f of C would be a y sub 0, or y sub naught is equal to zero. In other words, that is, in fact, a zero of the function. In addition, what about the sign change? Well, we, of course, can see that f of a is going to be negative because it lies below the x-axis. f of b lies above the axis, so it's positive. So you can see that we have a sign change. And that if you have a sign change from negative to positive, or vice versa, the intermediate value theorem implies that you will have a zero of the function in that interval that goes between A and B. Wow, that was great. In this lesson, we explored polynomial functions of degrees 3 and 4, as well as their graphs. Be sure to work the exercises that your teacher assigns, and we'll see you next time.